Welcome back. In the last video, what we did is we looked at the mechanism of biotin carboxylase, and we found that that mechanism is used by many different um, uh, carboxylases that involve biotin, ATP, and bicarbonate. And what we found also was that the biotin is ligated to a lysine residue in the active site, and in one orientation, uh, in one rotational state, the biotin can interact with domain one, which is the biotin carboxylase. But if you were to rotate the lysine residue along with the biotin, it could interact with a second enzyme called transcarboxylase. And both of these enzymes work together and are part of the same complex. But in one case, the biotin interacts with biotin carboxylase. But if you rotate it um, using the lysine residue, it can actually interact with the transcarboxylase. So in this video, we're actually going to look at the transcarboxylase mechanism. And also, another important thing about this particular um, uh, mechanism it's, is it's also well conserved. We saw that biotin carboxylase mechanism is very well conserved. Um, it, in fact, it's identical in pretty much every carboxylase that you'll find that works according to this mechanism. And so too is the transcarboxylase. Okay. So what we're assuming at this point is that we've already generated carboxybiotin or sometimes specifically it's N-carboxybiotin, right, because the carboxyl group is attached to a nitrogen. And now that we've generated that, um, the biotin, which is this right here, this it's now carboxylated, right? It's going to rotate. It's going to rotate over here, and it's going to interact with the transcarboxylase domain. Okay, and that's where we left off in the, in the last video. We saw how we carboxylated biotin. Now let's actually look and see how you carboxylate other molecules, and that's catalyzed by the transcarboxylase. Now. Um, there are actually functional residues in the active site here. One of them is going to be a lysine residue, and that's going to be situated basically above this carbonyl right here of the biotin. And then below it, there's an aspartate residue. The lysine exists at rest in the protonated state, as we would expect at physiological pH. And the aspartate exists in the deprotonated state. Both of them are going to be involved in, in Bronsted Lowry acid base proton transfers. Okay. And in the first step, what we're going to do is we're going to tautomerize acetyl CoA. So this critical aspartate residue in the active site is going to deprotonate um, this carbon of the acetyl CoA, forcing tautomerization. Okay. And we note that tautomer of acetyl CoA right here. Now, of course, in the process, we generate an enolate version of acetyl CoA. And as we know from our studies of carbonyl chemistry, enolates are terribly unstable. They're very reactive. And so there's a driving force to re tautomerize the acetyl CoA back to its carbonyl state. But instead of just simply doing a, a simple tautomerization back to a carbonyl, um, it's going to form the carbonyl, but you're also going to get nucleophilic attack from these pi electrons, and those pi electrons are going to attack the carboxyl group of the carboxybiotin. Now, some textbooks will just show this as a simple loss of a leaving group, um, but some purport that it actually goes through a nucleophilic acyl substitution type mechanism, which is probably the most probable mechanism that it's going to go through, and we'll do that here. So you would generate a tetrahedral intermediate here, but remember that that's short-lived. It'll quickly collapse back to the trigonal planar state. So what's going to happen is, is keep in mind that biotin, at least with the carboxyl group attached, had this amide linkage attached to it, right? And so instead of just simply losing a leaving group, which would be biotin, we're actually going to tautomerize the amide. Um, and so these electrons right here are going to come in and form the shift base. And we're going to actually cause nucleophilic attack of these pi electrons on the lysine residue, okay? And so what we end up generating is this molecule right here. So what we generate is this guy right here, okay? And if you look at this part of the molecule, I'll do this in orange. If you look at this part of the molecule, um, something should immediately strike you, and that's that it sort of looks like an enol, right? An enol would be in this form, right? So you'd have a double bond right there, uh, and then you'd have this oxygen that's protonated, right? This is an enol. 
And as we know, enols are very unstable. High energy, there's a driving force to retautomerize, right? And this is not an enol by any means. In fact, it's really just the protonated tautomer of an amide. But there is a driving force to retautomerize, and that's done using the lysine and the aspartate, right? Keep in mind the aspartate's protonated because it deprotonated acetyl-CoA, okay? So what's going to happen now is the lysine now in the deprotonated state is going to reabstract the proton from this um, tautomer of the amide, forcing carbonyl reformation, and then these shift base electrons are going to come and reabstract the proton from the aspartate residue. And what that effectively does is it regenerates the protonated state of lysine and the deprotonated state of the aspartate. And along with it, we end up regenerating the resting state of our biotin. So notice that our biotin now is in the state that it was at the very beginning of our mechanism right here. Okay, so it's re we reset biotin, and in the process, we end up generating this guy, which is malonyl S-CoA. Now, one thing I want to point your attention to is the step that we did that in, because we sort of glossed over it a little bit and focused on the biotin itself. But when we had this guy right here, which is our enolate version of acetyl-CoA, when, when we reform the carbonyl and these electrons come out and attack this carboxyl carbon right here, we end up getting a nucleophilic acyl substitution, but in the process, that's where we actually generate the malonyl-CoA. Okay, So this carbon that I'm about to circle, let me do this in purple. This carbon right here that's in purple, Okay, that carbon, that's this one right here. Okay, And you can even make the argument that that carbon in purple, keep in mind that that was the carbon that came from bicarbonate, right, from the initial step when we activated bicarbonate using ATP. That's the same carbon that came from bicarbonate. So when we look at the initial step where we had this carbon that was part of bicarbonate, if we track that carbon through the end of this mechanism, that carbon is going to wind up as the carboxylate carbon of malonyl-CoA. So that's what this molecule is right here. This is malonyl S-CoA. And as we mentioned in um, the pr a previous video, and actually in this video as well, um, the actual biotin, um, once it got carboxylate, it rotated over to the transcarboxylase domain and we just saw the mechanism that happens there. Well, that that rotation towards the transcarboxylase domain is really just done through changes in the enzyme conformation. But as soon as we take that carboxyl group right here, as soon as we take that off of biotin and put it on acetyl-CoA, there's another change in conformation, which is going to reset the enzyme back to where the uh, biotin is now in orientation with biotin carboxylase. Okay, So there's an interplay between these two subunits. In one case, we start with the biotin interacting with biotin carboxylase. It gets carboxylated and changes in enzyme conformation, rotate the biotin to interact, interact with the transcarboxylase. Once the transcarboxylase catalyzes its reaction to form malonyl-CoA, the biotin loses carbon dioxide, right, in, in, being attached to acetyl-CoA, and it rotates back to orient with biotin carboxylase, all driven by changes in enzyme conformation. Okay, And that's the interplay between these two subunits. Okay, In another video, we'll actually look at the regulation of this enzyme, and as we'll find, it's an allosteric enzyme. Okay, Now, one thing I want to mention just to, 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 to leave you with before um, we go into any other videos is that this malonyl-CoA that we generated is an extremely important molecule. And as we mentioned in the first video in this playlist, it's important because it's used in fatty acid biosynthesis. Okay, So all fatty acids um, are going to be, require the use of malonyl-CoA um, to build them up um, from acetyl-CoA. So in, in this step, we generated malonyl-CoA from acetyl-CoA, and then we're going to use those malonyl-CoA building blocks to generate fatty acids two carbons at a time. Okay. So if you notice, if you notice um, 
there's actually three carbons in this section right here of malonyl coa so if we look at this section there's actually three carbons okay what we're going to find is actually the two carbons that actually become incorporated into the fatty acid are this one right here that's part of the carbonyl and this one so those are the only two carbons that are going to get incorporated into the fatty acid this carboxyl group right here is actually just going to get lost as carbon dioxide so we actually actually use carbon dioxide to attach it to biotin and then we're just going to lose carbon dioxide again so really the function of that carboxyl group is just to activate um, the acetyl coa okay and when we look at the mechanism of fatty acid synthase we'll see why that is okay so the enzyme system that's actually going to use malonyl coa as building blocks to make fatty acids is called fatty acid synthase and this is a classic example of an enzyme that uses something called substrate channeling it's a huge enzyme complex that's going to um, basically take malonyl coas and condense them two carbons at a time into a fatty acid okay and we'll look at the mechanism of fatty acid synthase in another video I think this gives you a good starting point we've seen how we use a biotin dependent carboxylase generate n carboxybiotin and now we have this building block that we can make fatty acids from and that's malonyl SCOA so just bear that in mind that the carbons that I highlighted in yellow those are the ones that actually get incorporated into um, the fatty acid the other one which let me actually do that in I'll do that in this color okay this kind of dark red that's just gonna get lost as carbon dioxide okay and when we look at the mechanism of fatty acid synthase we'll see that okay and we'll do that in the next video see you soon